It's a slow fade. It's a slow fade. Awesome. Amen. Good morning, church. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's good to be back with you. Thank you for letting me get away for a few days with my family. It was awesome, exactly what the doctor ordered. And I am so excited to continue where we left off a week and a half ago. It is relationship tune-up part deux, okay? Part two. This is not, let me repeat, this is not for married people. This is, this is for anyone who's ever been in a relationship, anyone who ever hopes to be in a relationship, or anyone who knows anyone who's in a relationship, because we need to have godly wisdom to be able to share with others. Because we look around, I'll tell you what, the state of the family in the world, woo doggy, it is under assault. The enemy, it, I mean, your marriages, your kids, your, your, your family, your spouse, they are under assault by so many different angles. In fact, I thought it would be good today. I went, I just Googled, what is, what, what is the state of marriage? What, is, what does it mean when you just type in marriage or husband or wife? Y'all, it is shocking <laughs> what comes up. Some of it's funny. Like the first thing I found when it came up is what is a husband? A husband is someone who, after taking out the trash, gives the impression he just cleaned the whole house. <laughs> Can anyone attest to that? Is, that? is it just my household? I mean, I, I'll be honest. I feel really proud when I've done a chore. And I come and Amy's like, well, bless your heart. You did so good. Because we're lost without our women, right? Like this next one here, I love this. The husband says, I've looked everywhere. I can't find it. Translation, I didn't look at all, and I am lost without you, my darling wife. <laughs> or as the case with me and my son Milo, when we go to look for something, and we say we can't find it, the translation is basically, it, it didn't fall into my outstretched arms. I, it's, it's missing. I, I, there's no way I could find it. But probably the most sobering of all of them. In fact, I thought about it, talked to some of my friends, and said, should I put this, I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you about it, because I want to soften it just a little bit, because it's, it's very striking, it's hilarious, but it's kind of sad at the same time. It's a picture of a man and a woman, and they're talking to each other, and they're each pointing at themselves while pointing at the other, and it says, if you were my husband, I would poison your coffee. <laughs> and the man's response is, well, if you were my wife, I would drink it. What? Is that really the state of the family today? I mean, that's, come, y'all, that's like, that's page one on Google. When you Google, you can all do it when you go home and don't do it now. Too many times, I think the church has been reactive to dealing with issues, to dealing with the family, to dealing with problems. And so many times, you know, I mean, you just ask pastors and marriage counselors, they are booked to the gills trying to put things together and trying to clean up brokenness and, and, and problems and fragments and all the, all the damage. And how about instead of being reactive, we be proactive and we start and we remind each other and hold each other to God's standard. And we look at God's word and we say, let's follow God's design and his standard and strive for it. Will we, will we blow it? Absolutely. Will we miss it? But that's okay. At least the standard is there for us. And at least the next generation will be reminded what the goal is. Not some watered-down, half-baked, limp wrist kind of thing, whatever you think is okay. No, no, no. What does God's Word say? Because that's what I want to know. I, I like me, but I don't really care about my opinion. I like you, and your opinion's nice, I'm sure. But don't you want to know what God's Word says? That's what I do, man. That's the standard. So today, we're going to explore a little deeper than we did two weeks ago. And we're going to look at these little things that start what I call the slow fade. What are these things? What are these issues that are, uh, you kind of look and you think, oh, that can't really be a cause of tension in a family, can it? And we're going to go deep. So if you're ready with me, take a deep breath and turn with me to Song of Solomon. Yes, let's get awkward, okay? This is going to be so good. While you turn to Song of Solomon chapter 2, let me welcome those who are streaming, those who are listening online. In fact, just this past week, I came back, I checked the mail out front at the church, and there was a lady who has been listening. She lives like 600 miles away. And she said, thank you, thank you, thank you for your church. I don't have one where I live. And I just wanted you to know I have found my church family online. Thank you. And she mailed a tithe check. It was pretty awesome. Thank you. So that's why we stream. So if you're watching us today, God bless you. 
Thank you for being with us. All right, everybody got it? Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and I'm just teasing. It's not that awkward. Today we're looking at a very G-rated one, so you can all relax. I saw you get tense. It's very simple, okay? In fact, this is one of the strangest, most cryptic, bizarre verses in all of the Bible. I'm going to let you know that ahead of time. So if we read this together and you're still scratching your head, that's the idea. It's okay, all right? Read with me. It says this. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, for our vineyard is in bloom. <laughs> what? <laughs> what in the world does that even mean? And how does that apply to our marriage, to our relationship, to our kids, to our families, to our friends? How in the world? Well, I tell you what, there is a lot of gold in here. So let's just start with the heavy exegesis and let's just dive in right here. I want to share with you some of the things I've learned as I studied this in the last two weeks. One of my favorite commentaries in, in one of my many study Bibles, you all know I'm a Bible nerd and I love to get new Bibles and I just smell them because they smell so good and that's just me, I know. But one of the things I learned were foxes back in the Bible days were closely related to jackals. Anybody ever heard of a jackal? Jackals, you may remember, in the book of Judges are what Samson got together, and he tied several of them together, and he lit their tails on fire, and he sent them into the fields of the Philistines to destroy their crops. That's pretty cruel. Kids, do not try that at home. Let me say that. Okay, that's not a biblical admonition. Don't go get the family pets. Tie them together and light them on fire. That's bad. Hear me say that. That's bad. If you're not a farmer and you don't know about vineyards, let me share just a brief thing. Foxes on fire and crops do not go together. It is bad. Samson did this to destroy the enemy's orchards and fields and vineyards, and it worked. And the Shulamite girl and Solomon, as they wrote this, they knew full well the danger to the vineyards that foxes, foxes were the worst. They were, they were like little mice that could go everywhere. And they would descend, not one at a time, but they would descend in large numbers under the cover of darkness, and they would eat the vines. And they would destroy the grapes, and they would destroy the fruit. And anything that you wanted that was of value, they would sneak in, and you think, oh, little cute little cuddly fox. No. When they came, man, they were like, doo, 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 and they would just, ah, 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 and they were rabid, and they would go crazy. These are not the cuddly foxes. These would sneak in, and they would do unbelievable damage. In this passage, the foxes are metaphors for the little problems that you face in your vineyard, that you face in the world of your spouse, of your family, of your children, as your parents, you relate to anyone. What are these little foxes that come and try to destroy the sweetness of your vineyard? That's what we look at today. And in our relationships, there is nothing other than your relationship with the Lord. There is no other relationship that has more power to impact the world than your family, especially your spouse. That is the primo. There is, there's no way you can measure the, the positive impact of a godly, loving, Christ-honoring marriage. There's no way. The ripple effects, if you throw a rock in a lake and you see it ripple out, it, a good godly marriage not only benefits those in it, but the children, the grandchildren, friends, coworkers, neighbors, the church, I mean, we're all the way out here. Even if you read uh, 1 Corinthians 4, possibly it even affects the spiritual realm where angels look on and see more than we possibly realize. Even after a husband and wife have left the planet, their legacy continues. Think about that. You probably know some. Maybe it was your folks. Maybe it was someone that you idolized or looked up to and their marriage just seemed so perfect and it wasn't perfect, but they strived for a godly marriage. And they live that. And you see that it's affected future generations. That's why today we can't afford to let these little foxes into our world. Foxes like unforgiveness, resentment, pride, selfishness, neglect. All of these will lead to what I've called the slow fade. And it is so insidious, it happens a little at a time. That's why they're called little foxes. Notice something here. It doesn't say the roaring lion is in the vineyard, or catch the great big grizzly bear. Why? Well, I started to think about that, and as I prayed about this, to me, I think you would see the grizzly bear coming. You would see the roaring lion. You're walking, bebopping down. You got your little kids in hand. Whoa. Back up. There's a big lion right there. You'd see it coming, and you would take precautions, right? But not the sweet little foxes, the little cuddly foxes. 
that'll turn and bite your face off. They will. And they slip in under the cover of darkness. And they're so insidious. You don't even know they're happening. And that is the first lesson for us today from the Song of Solomon. When it comes to our relationships, it's the little things that count in very, very big ways. Write that down and learn it because that is one of the secrets of having a healthy relationship. The biblical admonition right here is for us to be aware and be vigilant against those foxes that would quietly try to sneak into your vineyard. Are you on guard? I mean, church, are we even aware? Or do we have no intentionality? We're not even fighting for our marriage. We're not even fighting for our children. We're not praying. We're not, you know, if you don't, I promise the world won't. It's you. It's you and the Lord. Man, you're on the front line. And they are under assault. Are you giving the proper attention? Somebody else will. Hmm? Wow. Kind of quiet in here. Awkward. All right, we'll move on. As we look at these foxes that try to slip into our vineyard, there are endless ways the enemy can send foxes. There's countless ones I could go. I picked four today, all right? Four foxes, four common causes, if you will, that might be starting you on a slow fade, and we may not even be aware of it. All right, the first one I found, I was reading a great article by Ron Edmondson, one of my favorite pastors and marriage counselors, and he said, one of the simplest ways that you could be allowing a fox into your relationship is when you, even if you don't mean to, is when you allow other interest to slowly come between you and your partner. When you allow other interest to come between you. Now, you may be allowing this to happen and be totally oblivious to it. I was. You may be totally unaware. It may be totally unintentional. In fact, these other interests that come between you could be something even good. What? Oh, yeah, this could be something as innocent as another relationship, even good. It could be your children. What? Oh, pastor's lost it. Last time he goes out of town. This is so, so deep. Y'all hear me. Get this. This is even good relationships like children. Or maybe lesser relationships that are still good, like friendships. Or maybe it's even lesser things, like hobbies or work. Anything that gets a higher priority than your spouse. That is a lesser thing. That is a distraction. Think about this. There probably, if you're honest, was a time when the two of you felt like you could take on the world. Where you could, man, you were so on fire, like, woo! They were the first one you thought of in the morning and the last thing you thought of when you went to bed. And you had that passion, and you were so fired up, and, and you couldn't wait to, to go and share that with other people. And you were that flame, that beacon. There's a, a verse in Revelation 2.4. It was written to the church in Ephesus, and it says this, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. While that's not a direct ap- application to spouse, it does deal with the Lord. And you guys know, I have seen solid, good couples. You know some. You probably have their minds right now in your head who were once so committed to the Lord and his church. It was a stabilizing place in their life. It was where they could come and bring their friends and be with their kids and their families would come and get encouragement. And every week it would help them stay on that straight and narrow because the world is trying to get you off of that straight and narrow. And it was one of those places and it was so awesome. And then slowly, very gradually, they began to get off track and become infrequent attenders at best. What happened? They began to replace their first love with lesser things, distractions. Some of them may not have even been bad things in and of themselves, but it was the priority they were given. And, I mean, you you may know it. Pick Pick your poison. It may be tailgating at the Alabama game. But it's true. It might be where, man, you know, SEC, we got to go. I, I need a Saturday and a Sunday. I, you know, come on, kids. Isn't church important? Isn't God important? Yeah, he is, but roll tide. Well, my kids are watching. They see through that. Maybe it's sleep. <laughs> I'm tired, man. I'm going to sleep in. What is that lesser thing? Maybe it's golf. Maybe it's another job. Maybe it's horses. Maybe it's lacrosse. Maybe it's the lake. Maybe it's snow skiing. Insert your... <laughs> your thing that you can have in its proper place or it can be elevated to where it looks as if it is your first love. And slowly we let these other interests come between. So let me ask you, 
Let's, I don't wait for the end for the challenge today. I'm going to start peppering us with questions to get us thinking. You know I love to do that. Let's get uncomfortable. Here's the question, first one. Ask yourself, are there lesser things in your life right now? Are there distractions coming between you and your relationships? Okay. Question two. Are there lesser things, distractions, coming between you and the Lord and his church? Only you can answer that. Don't answer it out loud. Okay? Which leads us to the next step in the slow fade, when we allow unresolved conflict to remain. Oh, do I have to go there? All right, let's just do this. Every relationship is different. So is every individual, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. You might know in your relationships one who really doesn't mind conflict and will address it quickly, and then you got one who hates it, who runs from it at all costs, who avoids it. I just, just let it be. Just let it be. <laughs> let's just pretend. Let's just sweep it under the rug. It's okay. It's a... Here's the deal. <laughs> when we let these little things. It could be leaving the dirty clothes on the floor. It could be leaving the cap off a of toothpaste. It could be leaving the drawer slightly open more than usual. These things that seem so silly, and they are in and of themselves, but they're the little things, and they add up. And then one day, there's a fight that happens, and goofy stuff like that gets brought up. Why are you smiling? This is one of those things where you think things are fine and you think it's great and you've just, well, we'll just move on. We'll just sweep it. Here's the hidden gem. Unresolved conflict and hidden pain never disappears on its own. It never disappears on its own. Unresolved conflict, it, it festers. It can leave a wedge. In fact, Scripture is very clear about this. Look at this verse in Ephesians 4.26. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't let, and here's a, here's a snapshot of a couple coming to church this morning at Potter's Hand. This is somebody, this is somebody, right, on the way, oh, cold shoulder, I'm not going to talk about you. And you think it's fine? And then suddenly, one thing leads to another, and you have this big blow up. And all of a sudden, blah, out comes all these things you didn't even know they were thinking about. And another thing. And when you did that, and here's the list, and it goes on and on, and you're just like looking around like, what just happened? That's because unresolved conflict is a mighty foothold for the devil. You know what? Amy and I, we had a rule. I wish we, I could say I learned it 20-something years ago, but I didn't. We, we implemented this about 10 years ago, and it was based on this verse. And we decided we would never, ever, ever go to bed unless things were completely resolved. We wouldn't do it because it kept leaving a mighty foothold for the devil. In fact, we got to the point, it's almost comical, we laugh about it now, where if I've offended her or she's offended me, we've done something, and we go to bed, it's over. We can't bring that up the next day. We have forfeited our right to bring that up. You know why? Because it left a foothold for the devil. Because it would stew. And we'd just, no, wake up in the morning, give me those covers. I can't believe you went to sleep like that, <laughs> cover hog. You just, you, you're so, you're, you're just evil. And we go on, like, what did I do? I was just going to brush my teeth and... I can't believe, like, I, I totally, I honestly forgot what we were mad about before we went to bed. No, 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 we don't do that. And if she tried, it, it's like 10 years ago. This is not like, now. don't please don't think awful of us. But, you know, we come up, she brings something up and be like, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Time <laughs> expired on that. Statute of limitations. If you had an issue, you had a biblical mandate. You come and tell me about it. Don't let the devil stew on that. How long have you been thinking about that? How upset are you? How deep is that worry wrinkle right here? Because you're so mad and you just stewed on it. That's the devil. And he knew that. You see why the scripture says that? When you let unresolved conflict get in there and you, do, you can't do that, that is one of the foxes that gets in your marriage. Which leads us to the third one. And you're going to think this is the polar opposite. But here it is. This is a silent fox. Boredom and complacency. Oh, well, this is an easy one, right? Let's woo, spice it up. Do some juggling or something. Bowling night, where I wear my fancy shirt. This is one of the leading causes of marriages losing their sizzle. Their, this is why they unravel. Couples quit dating. They quit laughing. They quit having fun together. Yo, here's the secret. It's okay for your marriage to be fun. <laughs> you have God's permission okay. Some of us Christians, man, we look like we've been baptized in prune juice and lost our best friend and <laughs> shot our dog, right? I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. What is that? <laughs> Who wants to be like that? 
You love Jesus? Because I sure do. He's awesome. <laughs> what? Come on. It's okay to have fun. It's okay. Couples get so caught up in the busyness and the routines of life and boredom sets in and they begin to have a little bit of drifting. Here's what happens. The enemy loves this. You know why? Because suddenly when one or both spouses begins to drift, they start to seek excitement elsewhere. Wow. Man, that's dangerous. That is dangerous. You don't seek excitement elsewhere. You seek it in the confines of your safe home. So let me ask this. When's the last time you belly laughed with your spouse? When's the last time you laughed so hard tears were streaming down your face with your kids or your mom and dad? When is the last time that you felt your marriage was fun or your family was full of vibrancy? If you can't remember, this is one of the foxes that has crept into your vineyard. And it's an easy one to fix. The fox of boredom and complacency. Y'all remember when you couldn't wait to see your spouse? What was it about them that that captured your attention, that arrested you? Chances are it is still there. Perhaps you just haven't noticed it in a while. So many times we get distracted with life stuff, with kids and work and bills, and it becomes all we have to talk anymore. And those things that excited us, that thing that kept the boredom gone, those dreams are gone and they're now replaced with the mundane demands of life. Y'all, that's natural. But to stay there and let that be the status quo, that will rob a marriage of its vibrancy. And it will bring you to the last step, the last fox in our vineyard, when we begin living separate agendas. Ooh, that's a big one. Living separate agendas. Hear me. It is okay to have separate identities. No problem. It's okay to have separate interests. In fact, I encourage it. It keeps things fresh. It keeps things interesting. But it is not okay to have separate agendas. A house divided against itself will fall. The agenda of a couple must be the same. It could take two different people blending those differences together into one flesh. That is how you will stand up. When that's not happening, the marriage will slowly fade. So let me ask, is it time to have a little meeting and get back on the same page with each other? Amy and I have to do this from time to time. We do it over vacation. We set aside time, just the two of us, to reconnect and get realigned where we're going as a couple, what our goals are, what our dreams are. We did this. We were at Great Wolf Lodge. You ever been there? It's not quiet. (laughs) Thank you, one person. I thought it was going to be this kind of thing. We go and we get in the water. We have fun, play with kids and stuff. You know what? The kids are old enough. They went and played. I looked over at Amy and she's like, let's talk. I'm like, what? (laughs) I got my bathing suit on. I like, let's talk. I'm not joking. Three days later, she has not dipped a toe in the water. My bathing suit is dry because I looked into her eyes and I saw how much it meant for us to be able to talk all day long. It meant so much to her. Man, I'm at the water park, which really, honestly, is fine because that that cement floor hurts and those stairs are like really ridiculous. And I'm not 20 anymore. And... Milo has enough energy for everybody, so they just went up and had a great time, and I looked into her eyes, and y'all, we connected. We solved every world problem there is. <laughs> At three days, you can do that, and it was, and it was awesome, but the, we are on the same page. It took intentionality, and you go through, and that's what we do, man. A good marriage is worth the effort. It is not easy. Now, here's the deal. It can be especially challenging for those of us with younger children still in the house. Oh, my goodness. I totally feel you. Believe me. Never in a million years would I think I would be, at this point in my life, back with a seven-month-old in the house, okay? And while it's awesome and I love it, it has changed everything. There's no way it couldn't. Back when we were first getting to know each other and before the kids' man date nights would come along, y'all remember those early years? Y'all remember your first date? It was so awesome. It had bouquets of roses and flowers and chocolates all kinds of beautiful things, and you'd polish up your car, right, guys? You'd vacuum them up and get out the three-week-old cheeseburger under the seat. You know it was there in the French fry? Is is that just me? Okay, all right. Maybe you didn't do that. And you're vacuuming, you're cleaning, you're finding old stuff, and you're thinking, I'm going to put on some smell good, right? You're going to put on the fancy clothes. You put on like eight squirts of the smell good. You know what I'm talking about. For me, in my era, it was eternity for men. (laughs) 
and it smells for eternity. <laughs> and when I had a little bit more jingle in my pocket, I could upgrade to cool water. Anybody remember that? Or Drakkar, huh? Yeah. Man, that stuff's awful. I can't. It stings the nostrils now. But back then, we thought it was, we would spare no expense in going out on that first date, right? We put so much energy into it. We'd roll out the best. Here's a picture of my very first date. I've shared it with you before. There we are, and I'm so excited. I've, I even put on my one and only super shiny silky suit and my smell good. I don't know why Santa's in this picture, but <laughs> there he is, third wheel. It was awesome. I went out of my way to look good. I vacuumed my 1989 Mercury Tracer eight times. And it was awesome because we put intentionality into it. Have we stopped doing that? This was an awesome, awesome night for us. You know why? Because it led to date number two. I asked her out again. She said yes. You think I was excited? This next picture will reveal my joy in it. <laughs> Absolutely, I was excited. She said yes. Ooh. I mean, that's not to marry me. That was just, to go, would you like to go to Waffle House? And we did. And it was awesome. But date night now, when you all have kids, it's a little different. you got to put work into it. Church, don't neglect your vineyard. Now date night sometimes is sneaking away to the Publix across the street and sampling the free food. <laughs> right? That's okay. And maybe saying, I think I got $1.80. How much you got? Can we go to the dollar theater or the $2 or $2.50 or whatever it is and go and sit in those really tiny chairs that have lots of stains and they're nasty and stuff? But you can get rid of the kids for a little bit, and you go, and you do it. That's okay. Do something. Show them that they care. I remember reading this great article from Arlene Pelican. She's a Christian writer. She wrote about this exact same thing. One night, she went with her husband to Publix. She's going back to the butcher and the meat counter, deli counter, and she sees one of these. You ever seen one of these? Take a number. Y'all know what this is? You take a number. It's not rocket science. You take a number. And she said the weirdest thing happened. She was walking up to it. She had her husband with her. I think his name was James. She goes to take a number, and she freezes. And all of a sudden, a weird question raced through her mind. She said, I wonder if my husband ever feels like this. And she said before she could answer the question, conversations started to shoot through her head, real, honest conversations that she had had over the last few weeks. And she said it blew her away. She said, she remembered this, sorry, babe, I can't do dinner with you tonight. Remember, we've got to get to gymnastics. Take a number. Yeah, I'd love to go on a vacation, just the two of us. Awesome. In 20 years, take a number. Intimacy with you? Love it. Oh, can't. Sorry. We both have to get up early. We've got work tomorrow. Say it with me. Take a number. And she said, she started to look at this, and she realized the hectic life and the work and the children her spouse was now ranking about 89th. That leads to a fade, to a, to a slow fade. Before the kids, man, he was your focus. She was your focus. She was your priority. And then the kids come along, you have all these little, little people in the house, these wee ones running around. And man, they don't even pay rent. And they're suddenly consuming all of your time and your energy and you know, I read just this week that the wife knows everything about the little wee ones, knows their interests, their dentist appointments, their romances, their best friends, their favorite foods, their secret fears, their hopes and dreams, and the husband is vaguely aware of some short people living in the house. <laughs> what a difference. Let's be honest. It is so easy to let kids become the centerpiece of your universe. It is so easy to let kids become everything about your family's life. One of the things that makes a home stable and healthy and happy is when mom and dad are inviting their kids into their already stable and holy relationship. That, not the other way around. We get this so mixed up. It's mom and dad's relationship that's the anchor piece instead of the children being what the whole universe revolves around. Man, that sounds radically different from take a number, doesn't it? Think about that. There is nothing better for your kids to see than a stable, loving, happy mom and dad who love Jesus and who love each other. If you don't believe me, ask them. Nothing freaks out my kids more than if they hear Amy and I raise our voice. Nothing. Not the boogeyman. Not us struggling to pay the bills. 
Nothing freaks them out more than when they sense tension between mom and dad. Wow. Y'all, we know people. You know people who have built their lives so much on the kids that when they leave home, that couple is clueless how to relate. They struggle because it's been so long. They don't know, and they're like, they look around, and, well, now what do we do? Who are you? <laughs> That's why it's so important, man. If we're not careful, that can happen. Remember, there's a giant person living with you among the wee ones, among the little people. That giant is your spouse. And if we don't be intentional with loving them and showing them priority, they can blend in like an old, faded sofa. You know, you're kind of used to it. It's always there. It'll always be there. I'm just going to let it sit there. It can, it's big. That sofa can take care of itself. There's always time for that. Mm. Arlene goes on to write, I remember that night. James comes and he says, he asked if I could get the kids to bed early a little quicker because he wanted to give me a foot rub. Arlene said, you would have thought I would jumped at the offer. But after putting the kids to bed, kissing them goodnight, I walked through the kitchen and I saw all the unwashed dishes and the kids' sippy cups and all those things in the dishwasher that needed to be go. And then I had to pack the diaper bag for the next day. I wanted to finish my to-do list. When I finally walked into the bedroom, James looked tired. I said something, mum uh, mumbled something lame like this. Hey, if you don't want to give me a foot rub, that's fine. I did take a long time downstairs in the kitchen. He asked me this. Why couldn't you just leave those dishes in the sink? I would have happily done them in the morning for just a few minutes with you tonight. And then it hit her. She said, I realized my choice to focus on the kids' work and hang out in the kitchen doing good things had inadvertently implied to my husband, take a number. Wow. All of that was legitimate stuff. None of that was bad in and of itself. None of it was mean-spirited. And that's how the foxes get in the vineyard. That's how the slow fade happens. It takes work to prioritize your marriage, to make it number one, to make your home stable like that. It is so easy to give lip service and say, yeah, woo, she's number one. Hey. But our actions give us away. And our kids see that. When we get lost in the football game, or catching up just a little bit more at work, baby, or grocery shopping, or video games, or social media, or driving the kids around to endless activities. What in the world? But here's the good news, because you know I can't stand it when somebody brings a problem and they don't bring a solution. If you have a problem, by the way, bring a solution with it if you come. That would be awesome. That would help everybody out, right? Here's the good news. The difference between a fading relationship and one that is vibrant is not far away not far apart at all. In fact, it, it begins with five minutes a day and one change you can make. This is, this is so, so simple. Start small because little things mean a lot. Remember that? This is what it is. Begin to look for small ways to connect. For example, when you're walking through the grocery store and you got your little scudders in tow and you're going, take your spouse's hand for just a minute. Take, whisper, I love you. Go give him a kiss on the cheek or kiss him on the cheek. Just don't ignore them. Follow the great advice of Dr. Cliff and Joyce Penner. They wrote 31 Days to a Happy Husband and a Happy Wife. They say, if you're really serious, do this simple thing. Take the kiss pledge. You know what the kiss pledge is? Every day for 31 days, simply pledge to kiss your spouse every day. He goes on, if you're really serious and you want to do it the ideal way, it needs to be at least five seconds long, preferably 30, and have some gusto with it meaning you mean it. Now, he quickly adds a caveat. He says, wives, warn your husbands that let them know this is not the go signal every time. And husbands, you can't get all fired up and try to whisk her away to the honeymoon suite. That is not what this is about. What this is about is it is simply a reminder that you are lovers. You're not just roommates raising kids together. What a beautiful idea. What a simple pledge. Church, this is huge. When you greet your spouse after a long day, when you come home or she comes home or you both come home, what do you do? Most of us grunt in their direction. <laughs> what is wrong with us? Man, that's your flame. It used to be. Look up from the phone. Get up. My wife's great about this. She gets up. She'll greet me. Or if she, she comes home after me, I'll try to get up and greet her. We stop doing what we're doing, and we connect. 
Lock eyes for three seconds. Just do that. Watch what changes. Notice them. Say something affirming. Give them a compliment. You smell nice, or you look good, or hey, I am proud of you. You look good. And if the guy doesn't smell good, don't lie to him. Just find something else. Just, just say something affirming. What we do when we do this, we say you're number one. It takes intentionality. If we're not careful, we can overcommit and be so saturated that we don't have time for them. And shame on us. So if you're serious and you want to avoid the slow fade in any of your relationships, I'm going to leave you with two practical things, two very simple things that I want you to do before you say yes to another thing, okay? Before you say yes and commit to anything, I want you to do step one here. Create a mock calendar before you commit. I want you to check out this calendar. It don't have to be a real one. You could just jot it out. Do, do a little grid of seven days, and I want you to look at this because here's the danger. When you look at your week and somebody asks you, hey, you want to do this, adding one more thing on the top of your head may not seem like a big deal. But when you look at it and it's all written out, you may be shocked to find out that you are now gone every single night of the week. Plus, you've got your, your weekend jammed full of stuff. Not good. Not good. Ask yourself this. How many nights will you have dinner together as a family now? One? None? Two? How many nights or weekends will you and your husband be driving in different directions, carting your kids all over town, doing different things, whatever? It could be good things, but they're stopping you from doing the greatest thing. When will you make time to nurture your marriage? Have you done anything in your schedule that stops you from putting Christ first? Man, that's the first thing that needs to go. Get that fox out of your vineyard. Y'all, the kids are watching. Are we slowly replacing our first love with lesser things? Look around. And the last thing, commit to a block of just us time. Commit to a block of just us time. Your time. You protect it. You can call it a date night, whatever you want. This is basic marriage advice because it works. There is something beautiful about even a simple lunch in the middle of the day or something beautiful in the night where you protect it, even if it's an hour, whatever works for you, you make it a date and you protect it. Because the danger is when you let this just us time slide, the little foxes sneak in and you start having little things add up and then it explodes. And you know that you've seen this, you've seen these times people put these little things here and these little things here and then all of a sudden a few days go by and you haven't even spoken, you don't have it connected. Then you let that turn into a few weeks and then you look around and you wonder why your flame has gone out or why your flame for the Lord is an ember. Well, because you've neglected it. We let foxes into that. Sometimes our life is so jammed, cell phones going off, kids are clingy, mercy's wanting something and we're trying to find out what state Milo's in and Marin's being great and we're having this, this time and the calls are coming in and you know, several people have passed away and then we've got a marriage, we've got a, this is falling apart and I'm dealing with the lease and this guy's being tough and we haven't found the place I want to go to and man, I'm ready to pull what's left of my soul patch out and, and it's going crazy and sometimes I will stop, seriously, I will look, I will, get, I will lock eyes with her, she's distracted, I will, I will, and I will say, I need some time with just you today. She's awesome. She knows. Boom. Man, she'll drop mercy. I'm not sure do that. But. <laughs> she will gently set mercy down. Or we'll call Tabitha, you know, or Leanne or Courtney or someone close, you know, Shannon, come help us out or somebody. But she knows it's important. And it is so important. When we let that slide, y'all, it's not good. <laughs> not good. You don't want to be around me. Some of you need to protect that time. In fact, that's why Solomon urges us in 2.15, y'all need to catch the foxes. You need to get those little foxes that ruin your vineyard because your vines have tender grapes. Your vineyard is in bloom. Don't forget to protect the vineyard of your marriage. Don't forget to do that. In fact, we're going to do that right now. I'm going to pray for you. We're not going to do the invitation, guys. I, wanna, I feel led to just pray for you today. Would you bow with me? Let's just pray. God, I thank you for this awesome group of believers. Lord, we lay our very souls before you. You see it all as an open book, as bright as noonday sun. There is nothing hid from your sight. So God, we confess our shortcomings, our sin. We ask you to pour out your mercy that you would wash us clean, that the blood of the lamb would just make us white as snow. And Lord, we lay our relationships before you, our marriages, our children, our, our moms and dads and 
anyone, Lord, that is still within our reach, God, help us to keep the foxes at bay. We invite you, Lord, to send your angels to go to war on our behalf. God, I pray you would do that, that you would put a hedge of protection around each home, each heart, each family, that you would shatter any demonic stronghold if there's a, a toehold that the devil has. Lord, I pray you would shut that door now in Jesus' name. I pray that you would kick them out, kick the demons out, and send your angels to stand guard, to form a perimeter, that nothing evil would prosper against them. Lord, I thank you. I thank you. You've given us victory. We pray that you would put your spiritual armor on us from head to toe, that we would withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. You are so good. Lord, help us to not abandon our first love. We put you in the place of primacy. We love you. We pray in your powerful name. Amen. 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 All right, so before we dismiss, I want to share with you some great things that are coming up. You're already seated, so you can just relax for a second. This weekend is the Daddy-Daughter Dance. This thing is awesome, and, and it, is, it is always the highlight of a lot of the kids, and they talk about it from year to year to year. Y'all want to be a part of this, but we need help to make this happen. If you can still help volunteer to set up, would you see Miss Leanne right after church, right here on the front row? Okay, we need help with that. Also, you'll notice standing in next to Mr. Phil there in the lobby is a big green bin. We need help with Easter eggs. Those, they're stuffed with good stuff, right? Not just like, you don't want like real eggs, like yeah. runny yolks or anything. Okay, all right. So like candy and neat little toys and stuff in there. If you can help bring Easter eggs for that, Easter's coming up fast. Which brings me to our next big thing on April 8th. It's a Saturday. We're having our community-wide outreach. It is our annual block party, and it is going to be awesome from 11 to 3. We're going to be bringing in all kinds of great rides and face painting and stuff. We are going to be there in force to meet our neighbors, to love on them, to answer questions, to hand out information about our church if they're interested, but just to have a wonderful time with our neighbors, okay? Mercy's excited about it because I hear her right over there. You need to invite your friends. Put it on your calendar. It's coming up fast. That is the day before Palm Sunday. We will be inviting everybody that comes to Palm Sunday and to Easter Easter Sunday morning is going to be huge. You don't want to miss it. I am preaching a sermon that I have never even heard preached before that is something I'm so excited about. We talk about the resurrection. Now we're going to look at what is our resurrected body going to be like? What can you do with your resurrected body? What are the things that uh, we don't even talk about? What will the heaven be like for you in your new resurrected body? And it is so fascinating. I'm so excited to share that. And also, we've been having a huge, great impact and uh, crowd coming for refit, we are going to add child care to that. And that is going to be something, if you're interested in that, would you see Courtney right here on the second row, very quietly raising her hand because she hates it when I single her out like that. She's sitting there, can we put a spotlight on her, Tion? If we could do that. <laughs> this is going so good, and, and it is awesome, and, and it is getting my cholesterol down and my blood pressure down. Y'all want to check it out tomorrow night from 7 to 8, we'll be having it. This Saturday, we would usually have it. This is a one time we're not going to have it because we have a wedding. Lee and Kim are getting married right here. So we're excited about that. And we've had a lot of people come up. I'd love to come and be a part of that, but I just don't have child care and I don't know what to do. We're going to try to see what the need is and see if we can meet that. Okay? Awesome. Lots of great things going. I'm so excited about what God's doing. Let me stand and pray one more time for you here as we go. If you'll stand with me, I will dismiss you with a prayer and a blessing here. Awesome. Let's pray together. God, we are so grateful for all you do. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. It is all about you. God, I pray this week you would open the doors for us, that you would smooth out the road. You would give us joy for the journey. May people see a spark in our life. And when they ask where it comes from, may we point them to you. That's our prayer as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have an awesome week. Love you.